And uh, yeah, we can now jump right into the talk. So today I'm happy to introduce Yu Feng Yuan. He's a master student at the RLA lab here at University of Alberta. And he's going to tell us about a multimodal observation space for robot learning. Oh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Yu Feng, and I work with Ru Pang. Uh, so today, I would like to share a little about the multimodal observation space for robot learning. So first, uh, I will explain the problem setting, explain what is a multimodal observation for robot learning task. And, uh, and then I will talk about some of the tricks that improve the sample efficiency in the in a related uh, problem setting. And then we will evaluate those tricks, see if they are effective in our multimodal problem setting. So let's start from the environment. We will use, use this environment, Richard, from the DeepMind control suit as our example to explain what is a multimodal observation space. So in this environment, the agent will be controlling this two joint robot arm. And uh, there's a red dot here you can see, which is randomly generated for every episode. And the goal of this task is to reach to the red dot, which is a target, as soon as possible with the tip of this robot arm. So this is a, a reacher task. And if we want to solve this task, there might be two kinds of observation spaces we can consider. So first, if we know the joint angles, joint velocities, and uh, target position, we can concatenate them into a vector and use this vector as our observation space. Since this observation space is pretty simple, it just consists of three, uh, uh, three tuples. So it should be able to be learned uh, in a pretty sample efficient way. And uh, as this observation space is pretty low dimensional, we can probably use a small model to feed the data and uh, it could make our learning more stable. But the problem is that this kind of observation space is not very practical in a real setting. So suppose we implement this task, this reacher task with a real robot arm and the target is randomly placed uh, for every episode. So in this case, there's no way we can get the exact target position for the, for the task, which makes this observation space impractical for real city. So to solve this problem, we can actually directly use the image as the observation space, which is the image we see here. We directly use this at our observation space. So this can definitely work in a real setting because by using the image, we don't assume any knowledge about the target or the robot itself. So it can work in a real setting, but it should be less sample efficient because now we have to involve the image in our uh, learning system, which means we probably have to use a more complex model like convolutional neural networks to process the image. And it could also be unstable because if the image is involved for a actor critic algorithm, usually uh, the actor part and the critic part will share the representation part, which makes the joint optimization a little bit more difficult. And I will get back to this later. So the setting, the multi-model setting we're interested in looks like this. Uh, we assume that we have the knowledge about the target, target itself. And in this, in, in this environment, particularly, it's uh, joint angles and joint velocities. We assume that we know those information, but we don't assume any particular knowledge about the target itself. So the target information has to be acquired from the image. And this becomes a multimodal observation space. Um, and the target information is contained in the image while the uh, information for the robot itself, it's just a vector. So this can work in real setting because usually uh, the joint information of the robot is accessible and it should be more efficient than learning completely from images. 
because now part of the information necessary for the agent to learn, like the join information, is already given as a vector. So in this case, uh, the agent just need to extract uh, features that uh, related to the target from the image, which could make the representational learning part easier in our case. So um, as our ultimate goal is to use this multimodal setting for real robot tasks. So the sample efficiency is our first concern. So next I'm going to introduce some tricks that are pretty useful uh, in when learning completely from pixels. And then we will verify them, uh, whether see whether they are useful in this multimodal setting. So let's start from the first trick, which is a gradient detach, uh, which prevents uh, the gradients from the actor to update the convolutional encoder. So if we use the image to train an actor critic algorithm, the model will look something like this. It will have it will have only one convolutional encoder, and two separate MLP part, one for the critic and one for the actor. The reason the reason we we use a shared shared convolutional encoder is that training two convolutional encoders are just uh, too computationally expensive, considering the amount of samples needed for a reinforcement learning agent. So. Usually, people will share this convolutional part. So the so the idea of gradient detach is that the gradient from the critic loss will be used to update the weight of its own MLP part as well as the convolutional part. But the lo the actor loss will only be used to update its own MLP part, which means that. Uh, the actor loss doesn't update the convolutional part. Uh, although this is pretty empirical, but I think the intuition behind this is that uh, the way the critic learns is more similar to the paradigm of supervised learning because we will uh, form some kind of target and do regression towards that target, which might make the critical learning more stable than the act learning. And the second trick is a frame stack and has been used since, uh, since DQN. Uh, and the idea is pretty simple. Uh, you simply stack n recent frames as the observation space. And this is actually critical to um, robot manipulation tasks if you are learning completely from the image. Because as you can see, from a single image here, the agent will not be able to figure out um, any velocity information of this robot. And only by stacking a few recent frames can the agent figure out the, ve the velocity of the robot arm, which is necessary to solving this task. And the last trick is a very new trick, which is random augmentation. With, uh, for example, you can randomly crop or shift the image. Say if we, if the original image size we use is a hundred by a hundred, then we, then for the random augmentation, we can randomly crop a patch from the image. So for example, we can crop a patch and we get a patch of uh, 84 by 84. So by doing this, uh, by doing this, we are actually diversify the training set that we have because uh, for the same image, it might be sampled multiple times during the training iterations, but, uh, but every time this image is sampled, what the agent get is a different patch from this image, which uh, which actually diversifies the training set, and which might potentially uh, reduces overfitting. So next, we're going to um, um, to uh, verify uh, whether those three tricks are useful in our multi uh, model setting or not. 
And the algorithm we'll be using is soft actor critic, which is an off policy algorithm that optimizes the maximum entropy objective. And uh, we train the we train each each configuration for 500k time steps, and we show the evaluation performance after 500k time steps. And the model architecture we use uh, is something like this. It's pretty similar to the model architecture we saw. And the only difference is now we add the uh, joint information after the convolutional part. So it works in this way. So we, we will still first fit the image into the convolutional part, and then we get the feature vector. And after we get the feature vector, we will concatenate this feature vector with this those joint information and get a new feature vector. And then we fit this new feature vector to the actor MLP and the critic MLP respectively. So this is a, a model architecture under our multi-model observation space. And this is a experiment result. The first result is soft anchor critic learned from the original observation space, which is just a vector, uh, including all the joint information and the targeting information. So the image learning is not involved in the, in the first result. And we use it as a baseline to compare our multimodal study. Uh, so this action, so the, the state-based soft outer critic actually did pretty well because the maximum return in this task is just 1,000 and it get very close to that. Then we try to naively implement it multimodal soft outer critic for this. And, and we can notice uh, it performs really poorly. By naive, I mean uh, the only modification we did is to um, modify the model architecture and everything else remains the same as the state-based algorithm. So, but it performs really poorly. Then we try the three tricks we mentioned, see if they helps. So we first tried the idea of gradient detach and it, it showed some kind of improvement on the performance. And then we tried the, the idea of frame stack and it does not help in this environment at all. But this is, this, is, is, this is expected, as I mentioned, in this environment, the purpose of doing frame stack is to provide the agent with velocity information. But under the multimodal setting, the velocity information is already given as a vector. So, so doing frame stack does not provide agent any additional information. So it is expected that it does not help. But it should be noted that because in this environment, the target is stationary during one episode. But if the target is movable during the episode, probably frame stack will still be useful in the multimodal setting. And last, at last we try the multimodal setting plus a random augmentation and uh, it significantly improves performance, probably due to the fact that doing uh, random augmentation significantly um, diversifies the, the, the training set. So it turned out that in this particular rich environment under this multimodal observation space, uh, the gradient detach and random augmentation are both effective. So last, we tried a combination of those two, and we actually achieved the performance. It's similar to the state-based result. Uh, of course, it should be noted that for this richer environment, because it's pretty simple, and there are already papers show that this environment can be solved completely from uh, image observations and achieves performance very, very close to the state-based result. But we still think the multi-model setting, it's pretty valuable, especially in more complex manipulation tasks, because 
um, in complex, in more complex tasks, it's going to be very, very difficult to ask the agent to extract every bit of information from just the image. So our next step is that next we are going to investigate the existing auxiliary tasks in this multi-model setting. For example, reward prediction or image reconstruction laws. See if those auxiliary tasks would help in the multi-model setting. And then we would like to train a robot arm for real manipulation task under this multi-model observation space. And that's all for my tea time talk today. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, I can read it out. That, uh, did you provide the same dimensionality of input images in the frame stack versus no frame stack? That is four identical images as input versus four sequential images as input. Oh, for se sequentially. So, so for the frame stack, uh, what I mean is that uh, we will stack the end recent frame, which is uh, just uh, the, sequ the sequence, like the uh, three or four most recent frames, which is a sequence. Yeah, you think, sorry, I, was, I just wanted to, to clarify the question. I was really asking if you were providing the same dimensionality of input space. So when you provide frame stack, clearly you take a bunch of images from the past, you smoosh them together and you can stuff that into the network. Um, yeah. to have the same in input dimensionality, you might do something tricky like, you know, take four copies of the same frame for the non-frame stacked version. Oh, I see. Just to make sure that there's the same number of weights, there's the same number, like to make sure that the network architecture is identical in the two comparison questions. In the two comparison, oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's... I'm just checking if you did that or not, because I'd be curious to see if actually non-frame stack got worse or or something. Given that there were extra things to learn, there might be extra network complexity. Um, um, yeah. So actually, so for the for the result that uh, frame stack is not involved. Um, we only use one, we only use the single frame as the input. So the, yeah, so the weight might be a little bit dif different. Okay, very, very cool. And just, just to be clear, you didn't, you didn't like, with your diagram looked very comprehensive, but you didn't say put like an LSTM anywhere in there after the concatenated multimodal layer, like you weren't putting some kind of recurrent network as well anywhere in the, in the system. You, uh, you, you, pretty much had exactly as you showed in your slide, which is your comnet, then you have essentially a, a flat layer, and then the yep. two MPs. Okay, cool, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah there's another question in the chat. Um, uh, about uh, explaining what exactly multimodal observations are again. Okay. Um, so, so by multimodal, we mean that uh, we know the internal state of the robot we're controlling, but for anything external to that, such as a target, we don't assume we have knowledge for that. So. So, so this is the multi-mode of the vision space for the richer task, which uses the joint information from the robot itself. We assume that those are known, but for the target, we assume that we don't know that. So we have to acquire the target information from the image. So for this particular environment, the multi-model means that we will use both joint information, those vectors, as well as the image as our observation space. But of course, this can be scaled to more complex observation space. For example, uh, if the uh, robot has two cameras and you will get two images plus the joint information for every time step, or the robot is equipped with more, more other kinds of sensors and uh, you will get even more uh, different sensory input as the as part of your observation. I had one question. Yeah. So have you thought about uh, the different latencies latencies between different type of sensor inputs? 
for example your image can be sampled at let's say 30 hertz where your joint joint velocity joint data can be coming at a different rate of input so how would you counter that for a real robot have you thought about something like that mm, not yet because all the experiment for now are done for a simulated environment but okay. probably i think i think but we but we have a system that uh, uh, that uses this multi-model observation space for the real robot arm, the UR5R. And basically what we do is that we have a asynchronous system for this, which means there's a different thread for the different observations, one for the camera and one for the joint informations. They're doing their uh, job independently. So which means that the, the image is sampled as quickly as possible. No, uh, what I'm saying is, so let's say you have to inference at a given point of time and you have to take an action. Your yeah. uh, your observation that your representation that you make by joining the two image and the joint angle. How do you decide? Like, do you fix the latency for each of them so that they are sampled at a fixed rate in a real robot, or you preprocess them in such a way that you get a fixed representation? Let's say after every point one second. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the, the, the question. Uh, like, so you might have asynchronous threads to collect, da collect the data, but yeah. how do you synchronize the inferencing and the action taking part? I think we haven't considered this. Okay. I think that's a, a great question now. Um, and uh, uh, how about how about using something very natural, which is uh, you collect data as soon as they arrive, but then the yeah. agent has its own cycle time, which means that at a particular time t, it has to construct the observation vector, and at that moment, whatever is available, the most recent image and pro perception data is going to use that. Okay, yeah, because I was also thinking about this problem some time back and I was wondering how would one do go one would go about doing this. Okay. Thanks. Just to respond to Rapam, like I, I mean, I, I think over the years we've tried various um regimes in this respect, which I do all I thought that was a fantastic question that you asked and I'm glad you brought it up. Um one thing that we've noted is that, I mean, you could just, again, take everything as it comes in. You could wait till you have the latest version from every single sensory modality. You can use interpolation algorithms. You could, in fact, try to apply a predictive model so that you can predict the trajectory that the other sensors are deviating in. Um, you could try to do something that takes out outliers. This is an awesome question. And the fact that people are actually talking about this is, is wonderful because there's lots of good choices and, and what the right choice is, is actually something I, I don't know if we know yet unless Rupama has been thinking about this for years and has actually ready to put the rubber stamp on this being actually the right answer. No, you're right. It's still an open question. <laughs> cool, good. I have a clarification, clarification yeah. question for something you mentioned earlier in your presentation. Yep. So you discussed that um, for systems that are only using Actually, it's a, it's a two-parter. The first one um, is, can you give us an idea of how a system that only uses uh, image-based data streams do in comparison to like your naive multimodal uh, implementation? Uh, yeah, so there are, some, there are some papers, they already did this. And basically, the result they show is that um, by doing random augmentation, uh, they can get the performance very close to the state-based result. And uh, their performance is actually better than the performance I showed. I showed for, I showed after I did the gradient detach and the random augmentation. But the reason for this, I believe it is that they did some kind of hyperparameter search for the environment. So they basically use different uh, different hyperparameters for different environments to maximize the performance, but we didn't do this here. Okay, fair enough. Um, so the second question is actually about this random aug augmentation that you've been mentioning. Um, because you're trying to use, like, let's say if you're combining this with um, your n stack of frames and you're trying to use the sequence of images to yeah. learn things like velocities and the velocity of the target and, and all these things, 
Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious if you could touch a little bit on how you can do random augmentation in such a way that this doesn't mess up your ability to get the actual state from these images. So specifically, um, you can imagine that if you weren't careful with your data stream and you randomly cropped each image yep. uh, independently in the sequence, it would completely yep. destroy your velocity information. So how do you do this properly so you still get sample efficiency and diversify your data without making it useless? Oh, so so I think this can be answered uh, in two parts. So first, if so, this is a diagram from their uh, from their paper. And you can see here, they're actually cropping a very large patch from the image. So the original size is 100 by 100, but the cropped one is 84 by 84, which means most of the useful information is still remained in the, in the patch. And uh, those random augmentation will only be used for training, which means at a training time, you will do random crop, random crop for the image. But when you're evaluating the agent, uh, they will only use the center, the center 84 by 84 patch to evaluate the performance of the agent, which avoids the problem you mentioned. Okay, thank you. I think maybe the, the diagram you have here probably answers my question, which is simply that you would apply the same cropping to every image in the sequence, correct? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on this question, so uh, what if we crop it and the target that's cropped out, or if we crop the image, so say the target is mm -hmm. at one corner, but we crop it and because of the cropping mechanism, it comes at the other corner Yeah. or it moves significantly. So. Uh, like I'm unable to understand that clearly because we have to extract x and y coordinates of the target, right? No. From the image. Yeah. So I think uh, I think um, they avoid this problem by a carefully uh, chosen cropping size, which is from 100 by 100 to 84 by 84, and probably based on this crop size, uh, they they will guarantee that the target will always remain in the image. I see. Hey, Yufeng, I actually have a couple of questions as well. Yeah. Um, I guess the first one is, um, it's interesting that the image-based method can be sort of, uh, you showed with, uh, you say with uh, augmentation and the like, that you can get like near optimal performance. Yeah. I guess with multimodal, I was imagining that one of the strong benefits would be how you would be that you have a better like AUC area under curves such that using those the really key joint velocity, you can at least in the beginning do fairly well. I guess I was curious about is that something that's seen that like one of the advantages of multimodal is maybe you have like better AUC or faster learning as opposed to final performance? Mm, so because I haven't tuned the hyperparameters very carefully, as far as a learning curve, though I didn't show here, it's actually uh, similar to those that learns uh, completely from the image. But I believe that if we use a better set of hyperparameters, it might do better. I mean, in terms of how fast it learns, because uh, part of the information, like joint information, is already given. It should be easier. Okay. Yeah, I, I was curious if uh, yeah. that was the case or not. And then also, I, I guess I'm not the only one who has had issues with the random image augmentation itself, but uh, it bothers me. It makes me upset because, uh, like, with when you like, because this seems familiar with like sort of taken from supervised. With supervised, you can do it, and it sort of makes sense because uh, you want to teach that these sort of invariance of zoom and like, oh, oh, this wheel object could be coming at different sizes, so it's good to yeah. sort of be in and out. But like in, in this reacher task, like these cropped images, that is a feature set. That is like a set of image that you are guaranteed to one hundred percent never see it will always lie outside your sort of domain of mm. uh, experience. Yeah. And I, I like, 
I don't know. I just, it really bothers me that that's actually useful. And like your graph, it was really interesting. Like it was dramatic how much Im image augmentation helped, like so much. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think, so although they, sh in their paper, they show that the performance improvement is also significant, significant for richer, but uh, this is also true for some other environment like Hopper or uh, some Hopper or a uh, card pole like that, which which you don't have a fixed uh, which you, you don't have a fixed joint. But I think um, I still think the reason why this works is that they don't crop it too much. They still remain a large part of the image there, which content which makes um, which makes the observation that the agent see is not very, very different from what it actually experienced. When it's cropped like down to 84, 84, I'm assuming it gets yeah. resized to 100, 100 before getting plugged back into the network. Like it's resized, it's cropped down and then resized, right? Oh, no, no. So, so actually the, the network will only process image of 84 by 84, but we will store the original image with size 100 by 100. Okay. Um, thanks. Yeah. Uh, just a comment. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great point. And uh, it's also true that some sometimes uh, these tricks, they often reveal the deficiencies of the learning mechanisms than something that you always want to keep around. Something like gradient detach. Like, is that something you are really happy with? <laughs> oh, we check. Okay, now you think also. Uh, so no, yeah, right. Like, uh, it's a useful trick that we should probably use at this moment. But at the same time, we should probably try to understand what's the problem with passing the gradient through the pulse loss all the way uh, down to the convolutional encoder. So, yeah, and similarly for this one, what do you think? What is actually helping here? For random augmentation, is it just like train more with the uh, variations of samples? These are like wild, you know, guesses. Uh, do you have some uh, experiments in which you train the convolution network with, like, um, let's say, a fixed but good policy that somebody might have trained or something? Uh, instead of this data augmentation, and then use that conversation network as a pre-trained network or something. Like that might help answer if all that was required was a good pre-trained coordinate or something like that. I think it would also be good to see how different the value functions are between different rotations. Like, is are the like for the same image, are the random crops having a similar value or a different, a very different value? Because for a critic, the only thing that matters is the relative ordering of these states and not the actual values, I think. Accuracy of the actual values. Mm. Also, like, uh, does this actually improve the sample efficiency? Like, because the initial motivation was around sample efficiency, that images are very sample inefficient, and maybe uh, augmenting them with additional state information can make make it more sample efficient. So, like, I think over the Matthew's point about having an area under curve will help, like, understand that better. I think. Yeah, moreover, I think uh, uh, we need to take care to see if. Um, so are you using the same number of updates with the uh, random augmentation and without the random augmentation? Yeah. OK. But but the amount of computation, are there, like the total mm. computation might not be the same, right? Even uh, though you're using the same number of updates. It's actually the same if you don't consider the computation for the random cropping itself. OK. okay. But So uh, like when you say 500k, uh, steps, those are like real images, right? And yeah. from each of them, you create 
uh, more crop. So how many crop images do you create from each of them? Oh, no. So actually, we will, in the replay buffer, only the original image, 100 by 100, will be stored. And every time one image is sampled, we will take a random uh, cropping on that and get a patch from that for training. Okay, just put in a patch and not the original image itself. Yeah. I see. So that's why the computation is also the same. But the network will, network will be a little smaller, right? What? Sorry? For, for the random cropping part, the network will be a little smaller. Um, so actually, to keep the uh, size the same, uh, I always use the 84 by 84 as an input to the network. But we will always store uh, um, the image size with 100 by 100. So when I so when I don't use the random augmentation, I will use the centered 84 by 84 oh. patch from that, which means we don't okay. do the cropping. Yeah. Any plan for uh, real world experiments? Did you think about that? Did you run some? <laughs> I know you are having like all those nice questions, so it'll be a tough one to end with. Uh, I I have one question. This this just came to my mind. So what if we augment the joint angles and the joint velocities as well? Uh, you mean we directly, uh, for example, adding some noise to the vector input? So I tried that idea, and it doesn't work at all. <laughs> I don't know. So like any some very small Gaussian noise, and it destroys the agent. Yeah, those seem to be two unrelated methods, right? Because the supervised learning community has these image augmentations purely for dealing with things like overfitting in mm. conf, conf nets and overparameterized systems. But if you have the joint angles, I mean, I don't think you're too worried about overfitting the representation that you learned from those. Like it's already a complete, this is the state of the robot, right? I, I don't understand why you would want to uh, perturb those. I think, I think that's um, mainly for the sample efficiency. Um, by doing the random augmentation, you can see uh, more different samples from your training set, and which means, which means, for example, you probably originally you may need uh, two hundred k time steps to reach certain performance level. Now you just need a hundred k, which makes it more efficient. Out of curiosity, when you said it got destroyed, like you had a Gaussian noise, how much Gaussian noise? Like, uh, your... It's like the 0 0.1 deviation of the original deviation of each dimension of the vector space. One thing I was going to mention just at the end is if you guys were trying to show a clear um, improvement with multimodal um, data versus image-based data, is it possible to create a, a configuration for the camera and or the robot where from an image you are unable to disambiguate different states of the robot? Like if oh. there's singularities in the motion, right, where from an image you actually can't tell what the joint angles are, where you couldn't create you know, the map from image to robot state? Because that seems like a clear cut, you should be able to do better if you know that, right? Yeah, that's true. Because actually, DiffMind controls should just release a set of new environment 
which uses this kind of ideas. So in, in their environment, the camera is, is fixed somewhere and it can only see part of the robot arm, which, make, which makes it impossible to infer the configuration of the robot directly from the image. So to solve this task, we have to use both the joint information as well as the image because the image contains the target. Yeah. What would be a use case for just image-based control where multimodal is not better? Mm. Or does it even exist? Mm, I'm not sure. I think based on what he said, uh, if the multimodal data in terms of like the joint angles is not accurate, you might get screwed. Right? Um, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. If if there's a noise in the in the joint information we get, probably we can correct this with the information we have from the image. Another use case, I guess, I could imagine is just. Uh... Cameras are often cheaper than like if let's say like an on-body sensor. Mm. It's like it's expensive to get a sensor that's good enough that won't have significant drift and everything like that. Like cameras way cheaper. So I guess that's probably another. All right, uh, if there are no more questions, let's all thank the speaker. Thank you.